Today we're going to dive into Cinemachine 3.1 and take a look at what's changed in the new version. We're going to talk about the new events architecture and the new spline implementation and walk through some examples. We're also going to talk about the API changes and consider whether or not it's worth upgrading your existing project to the new version. Finally, we'll take a look at some of the interesting samples that are included in the new version and some of the interesting bits of code you can find there. Let's get into it. Installing Cinemachine is super easy. In the Package Manager tab, under the Unity Registry, you'll find Cinemachine there. Today we're going to be looking at version 3.1.1. The samples are pretty interesting, actually. It's worth bringing them all in. They're all very small and fairly simple. This version of Cinemachine has one dependency, and that is the Splines package. So whenever you import Cinemachine, you're going to get a version of the Splines package that has to be version 2 or greater. So let's quickly take a look at what's different. If we come back over to the Scene tab, I'm going to quickly create a new virtual camera. In Cinemachine 3, what used to be called a Cinemachine virtual camera is now just called a Cinemachine camera. The nice thing about the Cinemachine camera is that it's been stripped down to just the bare bones, which essentially means the camera is just a lens that has a transform attached to it. If I expand the lens section here, you'll see all the usual suspects. It's very similar to Cinemachine 2. But what's missing here is sections for body, aim, noise. You'll see under procedural components, they're all marked as none. And that's because in Cinemachine 3, you add those things as additional components onto the game object. Notice also there's conveniently a checkbox here for save during play. This is exactly the same setting that you'll find in the preferences tab. Now Cinemachine is doing this with a special attribute called save during play, and you can actually use this on any game object. This attribute is meant to be used at the class level, but there's another attribute you can use to exclude specific fields. Let's just see how you would use that. If I come back to my example code here, I'll add the attribute at the class level. Then let's have a public float for speed that we want to change at runtime. Let's have the no save during play for a max speed. And then just for interest sake, let's add a public vector as well. In order for this to work, you have to turn on that global save during play setting. And if you don't have any cameras in your scene like I have right now, then you can go into the preferences and toggle it there. So I'm just going to hit play here and I'll tweak all three of those values. Remember that max speed should not be saved when we come out of play mode. Now I'll just set the tracked offset one, two, three. Let's hit stop. And right away, we're going to get presented with a little dialogue that asks, do you really want to save these changes? Do you want to keep them? Click keep and watch what happens. It kept all the values except the max speed one. The creators of this script have written in the documentation and in the code comments that you shouldn't really rely on this because it's not very well tested. However, it's certainly worth going to have a look at, especially if you're interested in writing your own editor tools, because there are some very interesting things in here, including this static class object tree utility. OK, back to camera stuff. The easiest way to understand the component makeup of the new Cinemachine 3 setup is to just add a simple camera. So let's add a follow camera. And you'll notice that it has the basic Cinemachine camera component, but then it added two more components. You can see under the procedural components section that now two of those sections are filled out because we've added a follow component for the positional control, and we've added the rotation composer as our rotation control component. Now, when you add any of these camera types using the menu, what you're really adding is a template that adds the basic camera and then the components that it needs to make that work. The Cinemachine follow component here has extracted a lot of the functionality that used to exist in the Cinemachine virtual camera, but now it's in its own component. So you can adjust any of those values here. And this applies to a lot of the other functionality that used to exist in the Cinemachine virtual camera. Now, these are just separate components on this game object, and you can get access to any of them using the get component method. Functionally, everything's still the same. You can tweak all these values here in the inspector. You can shuffle them back and forth. You know, you can also come back up into the game view and use these handy gizmos here to selectively adjust things as you want. You'll notice that the values just get updated in the inspector. So this is interactive mode for the game view guides. You can disable that if you want, but most people find that pretty useful. Now, because everything's been decomposed into components, you can add and remove whatever you want onto here. So for example, if I remove that rotation control and hit play, you'll notice that now we only have the follow functionality. There's no offset, there's no damping, nothing. This is pretty plain. And in fact, I could also remove the follow component and now all we're left with is just a basic camera. It's not really any different than our main camera that we'd normally use. It's just a lens and a transform. 
So let's get rid of that plane camera and instead I'm going to select the player and come back down into my Cinemachine menu and this time let's add a free look camera. If you have a game object selected before you create the camera, it will make that game object the target of your camera. Now this camera template has added some different components. First of all, we have an orbital follow now, which you can choose as the normal three ring, or it can be a sphere if you want. Notice that what used to be different sections for top, center, and bottom are now exposed right here in the component, and you can slide them around there, or you can use these handy gizmos in the scene tab to just grab handles and drag them however you want. There's handles for adjusting the radius and for adjusting the height. The rotation composer for the free look camera is exactly the same as the one for the follow camera. So you can just adjust your offsets there. And the free look camera has two other components. One is just for adding some modifiers like distance and so on. And finally, we have an input controller that lets you link up either the new input system or the old input system. And if you have a component on this game object that requires input and you remove it, you'll get a prompt asking you if you want to add the default one or add a custom one that you've made. If you add the default one, Cinemachine is going to look through your input actions and fill out those fields for you. If we quickly look at the defaults that come with Cinemachine, you see it's very vanilla. This setup would be a great starting point for any game. Okay, so what if you've been using version two of Cinemachine and you need to change your project up? Well, all of the old classes still exist. They've just been marked as obsolete. So let's add a using statement here to bring in Cinemachine. And let's create a member here that will hold a reference to one of the now obsolete Cinemachine virtual cameras. Notice that I've got the yellow squiggly line because the class is obsolete. And of course, it's not going to show up in context menus either. So let's use a little trick from Warped Imagination and we'll add a reset method here that will add this component to our game object. And just for interest's sake, let's also set one of the fields. Then back here in Unity, I'll make a new game object, call it example, and I need to add that example script to this game object. And as soon as I do, the reset method will add that now obsolete virtual camera. Right at the top of the component, you'll see a button here that lets you do an automatic upgrade to the new system. Before you do anything like this in an existing project, make sure that you back it up. If I click the button here, I'll get a little modal window pop up. It gives you options to upgrade this object, upgrade all the objects in the scene, or upgrade the entire project. So I'm gonna update just this object. It will give me a new Cinemachine camera and transfer most, if not all, of the values for me. You can see already that Odin Validator is telling me that I have a broken reference now in my script, and that's because that old component is gone. Another interesting thing is that it's figured out already that I don't have a Cinemachine brain on my main camera, so you can add that very conveniently as well. If you don't have Odin Validator, you can also rely on your console. So if I were to recompile the project right now, it'll show me what errors there are, and then you just use that as a reference to go and fix them all. Now, I also want to point out that if you're not using any of the new features of Cinema Machine 3, then it's not really worth going through this hassle on an older project. Cinema Machine 2 is going to be supported for a few more years yet, and so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Back in our class here, we can change the reference from Cinemachine Virtual Camera to just Cinemachine Camera. Now, another interesting thing about programming with Cinemachine 3 is that all the M underscore variables are gone. That means instead we have to do something like cam.lens, and then we can access properties of the lens itself, so we can change the field of view that way instead. So if you have references to M underscore variables in your code and you're trying to upgrade, you're going to have to change every single one. So those are the main changes introduced by Cinemachine 3, that the Cinemachine virtual camera has been broken down into smaller objects and that a lot of the naming conventions have changed. Using Cinemachine in your project has not really changed fundamentally from Cinemachine 2. However, I do want to take a quick look at how we can extend some of these components and how we can use events. Just before we do that, however, I want to point out that if you're interested, there is an opportunity to join the Unity for Cinematics beta, and I'll leave a link for that in the description. Events in Cinemachine 3 are a little bit different than Cinemachine 2. Cinemachine 2 had events in Cinemachine Virtual Camera and Cinemachine Brain. The new version only fires global events via Cinemachine Core. It has quite a few events you can subscribe to. For example, when the camera gets activated, when a blend is finished, and so on. Let's make an example with a camera activated event. We'll add a listener and we'll just write a new method on camera activated. This is going to take in an activation event params. 
If we have a quick look at this, you can see it's going to send in quite a bit of information, probably the most important of which is the incoming camera, because we'll be able to tell which event this camera belongs to. So we could say if the incoming camera of this event matches the camera we're referencing in this mono behavior, then we want to do something with it. So let's just test this to see how it works. Let's drag a reference to the camera into our script here so that we can verify that the event is for this camera. Then I'll just hit play and I'm going to toggle the enabled checkbox. And right away, of course, we see the message in the console. So that's it in a nutshell. Of course, this is extremely powerful and there's lots more you can do with it. For example, Cinemachine Core also contains events for Cinemachine brains. So for example, the camera updated event will fire after the brain updates its camera. We could add another listener for this and we could just call it on brain updated maybe. Then let's make another method just underneath here. So we can see that this will pass in a reference to a Cinemachine brain. From the brain, you can get a hold of any kind of properties from that specific brain. If you were building something like a split screen multiplayer, you might have multiple brains in the same scene. You'd be able to get references to the one that fired the event. So it's worth having a look into the Cinemachine core class just to see what the global events are that you can hook into. There's another way to handle Cinemachine events in Unity, and that is with components. So you can add a component of different types here onto your game object. If you want to capture camera events, you can add this one here. This component will automatically capture events for this specific camera. On this game object, you can leave it null because I already have a camera on here. If you were to put this component onto a different game object, then you would have to drag a reference to a camera you want to capture events for. Now, what we can do is create a new method here in my script that we can access when the event fires. All of these events actually derive from Unity event, and they all pass in different bits of information. And just like the other events, you can do whatever you want with the references. For now, let's just output a message. I'm just going to change the access modifier, and then let's jump back to Unity. So now here for the Unity event, I can actually select my do something method, and that should fire whenever this particular camera is activated. So if I hit play and I toggle the box again, now we should see both messages, one from the global event being fired and one being captured by the component on our game object. That's a little bit of a boring example, though. Why don't we do something more exciting? So we could add a render feature when that camera is activated. I'm going to bring in an asset from Francon Games, which is speed lines. And I'm just going to turn the strength all the way up to one when the camera is activated. Let's go try that out. It would make our examples a little bit better if I actually added a Cinemachine follow component here. So let me just change the values so it's just a little bit above the player and a little bit behind, maybe minus four. And I'll deactivate the camera. So we'll just start with no Cinemachine cameras active. So just the main camera, nothing's happening, right? Just plain. If I turn it on, now our follow camera is activated and our render feature is activated as well. So this would be great for any kind of game where you've got uh, some kind of motion and you've got a render effect to display or anything else you might need to have start up as soon as a specific camera gets turned on or any of those other events, of course. Another big change in Unity 3 is the use of the splines package. Now, as you recall, that was brought in as a dependency as soon as we brought in Cinemachine 3. So I'm going to add a dolly camera with a spline. So I'm going to draw a new spline here with the spline tool. I just want a little path that kind of meanders between these boxes. Then I'm going to set the player to be the target of this camera, and we're going to have the camera actually follow the spline. Now, the camera already has a reference to the spline container, so you don't have to worry about that. Just make sure that your spline is looking the way that you want, and then I'm going to turn on this automatic dolly. There are already a few types of dollies that you can use, but a very cool feature of Cinemachine 3 is that you can make your own. So here in this list, fixed speed and the random one, those come built in. The smooth follow is one that I've written myself. But let's take a look at the fixed speed one quickly. So let's give it a slow-ish speed and press play. You can see it just follows the spline the whole time it's looking at the player. Of course, it's sitting at ground level, so why don't we move the whole spline up to about two? And let's switch it to the one that I wrote, the smooth follow. I'm just going to adjust some of the values here and add some damping. And now when I press play, the idea of this dolly is it's going to try and find a point on the spline that's as close as possible to me, but move as smoothly as possible. So it is a little bit slow, maybe it could speed it up, but you can see what it's doing. If I'm walking around in an area, you can have kind of a path that you just want the camera to be able to follow around, and it'll just keep moving along with whatever the player is doing at that point in the game. If I come to a stop, the camera will keep moving towards where it wants to go, but the damping will slow it down just a little bit as it reaches its final point. 
Now, this custom dolly behavior is actually really easy to implement. All you have to do is implement a simple interface that has three methods and one public property. Let's go take a look at this interface and then the implementation. The interface lives in the spline auto dolly class and it's called iSpline auto dolly. No big surprise there. You can see it's got a few methods at the top here, validate reset and a public property for requiring a target. And then one method get spline position. And that's the one that does all the math to figure out where it should be. Now, I made my class smooth follow. It just implements the iSpline auto dolly. And then I've exposed some values we can set in the inspector. Now I've made very simple implementations of a validate method, a reset method that puts the velocity back to zero, requires tracking target is true because I do want to follow the player. And if I page down here, here's my implementation for get spline position. It's really pretty straightforward. We're just finding the nearest point on the spline using the spline utility, the nearest point to the player that is. And then I'm just smoothing the motion as we get closer and closer to the player. So we're not going to go into detail with this script, but I will leave it in a gist if anybody wants to see it, if you're doing your own implementation and you just want an example. One other thing that I found really interesting about Cinema Machine 3 is that the samples package actually has some pretty neat code in it. Now we've looked at some of these mechanics before on this channel, but if you're using Cinema Machine as your camera, you might want to take a closer look at what's going on in some of these samples because it'll give you some ideas on how you can handle it. You know, so if you're doing right angle flips, you're walking on a curved surface, whether you're walking on the outside or the inside of it, this particular sample will give you some insights on how you can set up a free look camera to work with this kind of setup. On top of that, this package also comes with a very simple character controller and also a very simple car controller. Some of the other samples are actually quite interesting, like this one that fires off an impulse whenever the player hits the ground, firing an on land event. So in this setup here, as soon as I've finished a jump and I hit the ground, the event fires and it triggers off the impulse wave. There's a, another great one for locking on target if you're working with boss mechanics. And I really like the clear shot one as well. There's about 10 or 15 of these simple examples you can go through just to see how you can use Cinemachine in different ways. Cinemachine is a beast, there's no doubt about it, and it has a ton of use cases. But fundamentally, it's not much different than Cinemachine 2, and you can easily transfer your knowledge from one to the other, keeping in mind the things discussed today. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or anything to add to this topic. Next week, we'll be diving into a more advanced topic, so like, subscribe, turn on the bell, join the Discord, and so on. Maybe I'll see you there.